Good morning, Countryside. My name is Pastor Alex Lynch. I'm looking forward to worshiping with you today. Before our service begins, I have a brief announcement. A special pre-registration period for Journey to Judea is open for Countryside only. The public will get to register on November 1st. The purpose of pre-registration is evangelistic, so please do not register friends wanting to do them a favor because you have early access. This is all about giving you an opportunity to secure a tour for someone you know that needs to hear the gospel and put their trust in Jesus. Feel free to use the J2J business cards in the foyer for this. Take as many as you can use. Also, this evening is a J2J prep night, so if you're scheduled to be here, we'll see you then. Now, we will introduce you to some of our newest members. I'm Eldon Crenshaw. This is my wife, Cheryl. Why you want to join Countryside? It's very uh, simple. It's friendly, it's biblical, and uh, we like the people that are going here. Well, at this time, I would like to ask you all to stand. Let's open the service with these words from Psalm 147.1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting.
love came down to earth and made his home with men. The hopeless found a home, the sinner found a friend. Not to the power of but to the poor he came and humble hungry hearts was satisfied again what joy what peace has come to us what upon his back and hammered through his feet the innocent is cursed the guilty are released the punishment of God on God has brought me peace what joy what peace has come so gracious to us, hasn't he? Please pray with me. Father, we are overwhelmed at the gift that you have given us in Jesus Christ. What joy it brings. What hope, what help, what love. God, you have poured out in abundance upon us. You have given so much for us and to us. And Father, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we ask now, Lord, that you would soften our hearts to be able to return that giving back to you. Father, that we would be able to give you our hearts, we would be able to give you our resources, that we would be able to give you our lives to do with as you will. Father, we are so grateful for all that you have given and now we pray for your grace to be extended beyond Olathe, beyond countryside, but to our sister churches in Brazil and in Mexico, and into our sister church in Lawrence. Father, we pray that the preaching of your word this morning would change hearts, change lives. God, that Jesus would be lifted up and that you would be glorified. Father, we pray that in all of this, you would bless us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. This is a special time together where we observe the Lord's table. And by doing so, each time we celebrate our relationship to God and each other through the death 
of Jesus Christ. And in it, we remember, at the same time, we also declare. We declare what Jesus has done for us by dying on the cross through the elements of communion. So if you would like to participate this morning and you did not pick up one of these cups when you came in, please feel free right now to go to the back. We have tables back there that have plenty of cups on them. Please take one and join us this morning. Now, communion is for followers who follow Jesus. So if you have not trusted in Jesus for your salvation, or if you're under church discipline here at Countryside or another church, then we ask you to refrain from participating this morning. Now, why is that? Well, as I said a moment ago, the Lord's table is a declaration of what Jesus has done for us in our relationship to God. So if you haven't come to faith in Christ, there's no reason for you to participate. And there's no shame in not participating. We ask instead that you respectfully observe our celebration and our declaration of faith. Now, if you're under church discipline, either here at Countryside or another church, it would be inappropriate for you to declare your joy in a relationship to God in the the celebration of communion. So rather, use this time to examine your own heart and ask why you continue to act rebelliously towards God. But if you are a believer, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your personal Savior, then we invite you, whether you're a member of Countryside or not, to join us. Now, before we begin, I'd like to give you a few moments to reflect on your relationship to God. This is an opportunity for you to prepare your heart for the celebration of communion. This is an opportunity for you to confess any sin that you might be hanging on to this morning. So take a moment to ask God to search your heart and to reveal anything that you need to deal with. Let's do that now. giving instruction to the church at Corinth regarding the Lord's table, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul says here that this observance is a proclamation of the Lord's death. Now it's interesting that he doesn't mention the Lord's resurrection. Resurrection is our hope. Resurrection is what we look forward to. It's the final outcome of our salvation. And resurrection is something worthy of celebrating, is it not? But you know, as we wait for the realization of that resurrection, of that hope, it's important that we remember what it took in order for that hope to become our hope. Paul would write this to the church in Ephesus. In him, 
in Jesus. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Before resurrection could ever become our hope, there had to be forgiveness. Our sin separates us from God, and for forgiveness to be possible, there had to be death. As God would say through the Apostle Paul, for the wages of sin is death. But our death would not be sufficient to pay for our offense against an infinitely holy God. Only the infinitely holy Son of God, the God-man, could die for our sin and make forgiveness possible. Listen to these words of Paul to the church at Corinth. For our sake, He, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through the Lord's table we proclaim his death because his death is the foundation of our hope. It's only in his death that we find our promise of life, resurrection life, eternal life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. His death becomes our death. And his life becomes our life. This morning as we take the bread and the juice, we remember his broken body and his shed blood. And we declare his death. On our behalf as a celebration of life. Jesus said this. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Please take the bread and the cup that you picked up this morning and remove the top layer as we prepare to eat together. Before we eat together, I'd like to ask one of our deacons, Mark Urosco, to pray for the bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, uh, you are the great I am. You are a God of grace, God of mercy, a just God, a jealous God, a patient God, a loving God, a holy God. All-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign over all things, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for sending your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to to live a perfect and sinless life here on earth, Lord, leaving the glory of heaven and ultimately taking our sin upon the cross, taking your wrath that we deserved. He was the perfect sacrifice. And let, Lord, we know that it didn't end on the cross. We know that Jesus conquered death and sin and rose again, Lord. We know that he is now seated at the right hand of you, your throne, And that one day he will come again in power and glory and judgment. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together in remembrance of him. Before we drink together, I'd like to ask another one of our deacons, Kurt Hemphill, to pray for the juice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the spotless, perfect Passover lamb, sent by God to spill your blood on our behalf, that God's wrath may pass over us, <clears throat> pass over us that we, in you, Christ, is our one uh, Savior, the only way to true communion with God, to true um, reconciliation. We just thank you, God, for your gift of Jesus on the cross. We thank you for your perfect plan of resurrection um, to be with you forever and eternity for those who believe. We just pray, God, that we would glorify you in all that we do and say this week in remembering your um, perfect 
sacrifice on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together in remembrance of Jesus. All right, please stand as we continue in the worship of our Savior. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Let's pray together. Father, that's our prayer, is that you would keep us near the cross. Father, may we constantly be looking to Jesus, turn our hearts towards him. Lead us to the cross in those times when we need it desperately for restoration to Jesus. Use the cross, Lord, for those times of healing and hope when we are hurting and ashamed. 
Father, I pray that as we prepare to receive your word, the cross would become even bigger for us this morning as we hear it. I pray, God, for those who are here without a relationship to Jesus, that you would open their eyes, that they might truly see who Jesus is and what he's done for them, that you would give them ears to hear the message of the gospel and the truth of Jesus. Father, draw them unto yourself. Open our eyes now to the truth of your word. We pray in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> all right. It's good to see all of you this morning. You're just as smiley in hour number two as they were in hour number one. It's great. It's a special day for me. Um, uh, the couple that joined this morning is, are my in-laws. Eldon and Cheryl Crenshaw, we moved them uh, up here just over a couple years ago, and it's uh, been great having them close, and now to have them members of Countryside, and today is Eldon's 90th birthday. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. We've all experienced moments when things did not go as we expected. Maybe you planned a big trip, and the prelude to that trip was filled with expectation. But it just didn't turn out the way that you'd hoped. Or maybe someone invited you to a really nice restaurant, and they'd been really building it up, and you were so looking forward to that meal, but you just weren't as impressed as they were. It just didn't meet your expectations. You often hear people say after they meet a public person, like someone they've seen on TV or someone that's in the movies, oh, they were taller than I expected, or oh, they were friendlier than I expected. They seem so real, or sometimes it's the opposite of that, right? Uh, they were much shorter than I expected. Or they seem really cold and rude. I mean, all of us are aware of what it's like for an experience to either exceed or to fall short of our expectations. Well, that's where we are in Matthew this morning. A group of people were observing Jesus, and he didn't appear to meet their expectations. We're in Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17, if you'd like to follow along as I read. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed, but new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Now, every time we teach the book of Matthew, we want to emphasize its overall message with these words. Because Jesus is the Messiah King, we must worship and follow him. Because Jesus is the Messiah King, we must worship worship and follow him that's matthew's mission to reveal jesus as the promised messiah the promised davidic king but matthew also reveals that jesus is no mere man he does that earlier in his gospel through a miraculous birth jesus is the god man 
And he has so much more, or Jesus is so much more than a conquering hero that the people were hoping for. Matthew 4.23 sums up the contents of the entire gospel perfectly. Matthew writes these words, And he, Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And that's what we've seen week after week since then. Jesus is teaching on the word of God and proclaiming the good news of the coming kingdom. At the same time, he's reinforcing his authority as a teacher by performing countless miracles. He needs to perform a miracle in my voice. <clears throat> Sorry, left my water down there. In the process, though, Jesus was shattering people's expectations. Many times he was exceeding them, but thank you, Dave. I knew that was going to happen as soon as I pointed it out. <laughs> but nobody wanted to hear me screeching anyway, so. <clears throat> Many times Jesus was exceeding those expectations. Like we've recorded for us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. Matthew writes, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. At his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as one of their scribes. Or after he calmed a storm from inside a boat with his disciples, Matthew records this, and the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Jesus had exceeded expectations. At other times, his words or actions shock people. After forgiving the sins of the paralytic, Matthew tells us that some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. Only God can forgive sins. Who does this man think he is? And finally, last time we were in Matthew, some Pharisees were dismayed with Jesus over his choice of dinner partners. And they asked his disciples in verse 11 of chapter 9, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So one thing we can see clearly, really clearly, is that Jesus doesn't conform to anyone's expectations. He doesn't dumb it down to make everybody comfortable, and he doesn't seek to please people with his choices. He doesn't conform to anyone's expectations. And our text this morning backs that up as we are again introduced to a group of people whose expectations he didn't meet. I want to make two statements drawn from our text this morning for you to consider. The first is this. I want you to consider this idea. Your expectations may cause you to misunderstand who Jesus is. Your expectations may cause you to misunderstand who Jesus is. Now look back at verses 14 and 15. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now, the ones asking this question are some disciples of John the Baptist. But there's a second group mentioned here, and that's the Pharisees. Now, we don't really know if the Pharisees had anything to do with the asking of this question. But at the very least, both of these groups considered the ritual of fasting a very important act of Jewish piety, a very important part of their religious expression and devotion towards God. Now, scholars tell us that the Pharisees were known to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And we know from Jesus' previous teaching regarding fasting that many of them treated fasting as an opportunity to demonstrate to the public just how religious they were. 
And in his teaching, Jesus rebuked this kind of showmanship. And he encouraged his followers to prepare themselves for fasting in such a way that it would be difficult to determine if they were fasting. So he wanted them to put on their best face, to put on their best clothes, to walk with their shoulders back and their head held high, confident in their relationship with God. Because Jesus understood that fasting was an expression of the heart between a person fasting and God himself. Not, it was not to be an external show. It's not an opportunity to plead for pity. Or it's not an opportunity for you to, res- to get others to acknowledge your religious fervor. Jesus even used a Pharisee's self-righteous pride in fasting as part of a parable he told about a heart attitude that was needed for prayer when one is confessing sin. One of the individuals in that parable was a tax collector who humbled himself and he begged for God's mercy when he confessed his sin. The other was a Pharisee who thanked God that he was so righteous, mentioning even that he fasted twice a week. The point of Jesus' story was that one man was heard for humbling himself before God and the other man was not. He was too busy parading his self-righteousness before God and men. And so clearly, at least some of the Pharisees fasted for the wrong reasons. It was probably a lot different for John and his disciples. He would have approached teaching them about fasting from a completely different angle. I mean, their fasting would have been centered on repentance and prayer related to the coming of the one whom John was sent to announce. They fasted to plead with God to send the Messiah. They fasted and prayed for the people to repent of their sins and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. They fasted to repent of their own sins and to seek forgiveness from God. You realize in the Jewish law, only one fast was prescribed for the people. And that was on the Day of Atonement. But throughout Scripture, you find many people fasting as signs of sorrow and grief or repentance. Earlier in Matthew's Gospel, before his temptation, Jesus himself fasted. But this group of John's disciples doesn't understand why Jesus and his disciples don't fast more often. In fact, placed so close to the previous story of Jesus attending a party at Matthew's house, it seems that Jesus' ministry was marked more by feasting than it was by fasting. And this group of John's disciples wants to know why. Why is that, Jesus? They want to know why Jesus doesn't fit their expectations. And so Jesus tells them. Jesus is never afraid of a difficult question. Can the wedding guests mourn while the bridegroom is with them? That's a funny answer, isn't it? But it makes sense when you really think about it. In Jesus' day, weddings were really big deals, even for people without means. They were traditionally week-long, full seven-day celebrations with a lot of feasting mixed in. And Jesus uses this common understanding of a wedding celebration to make the point of who he is. John himself had used this very analogy with his disciples concerning Jesus. I'm going to read a couple of verses just to set up the context here. And they came to John, his disciples came to John and said to him, Rabbi, 
He who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Now listen to what he says next. Verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. With these words, which were very similar to those of Jesus, John revealed two things. One, he revealed that in the presence of the bridegroom, the friend is to find great joy. It's a moment of rejoicing. The wedding is a moment of celebration. That's the point Jesus is making in his answer as well. Fasting is typically a time of sorrow or mourning, But his time with his disciples is more like a wedding celebration. It should be a time of feasting and joy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus has fasted. He's not against fasting. And I am absolutely positive that during his life on earth and his three-year ministry on the Day of Atonement, Jesus fasted. He obeyed the law of God perfectly. But it appears he also wanted people to know that while he's bound to God's law, he is not bound to their rituals and traditions. Not in the least. But that's not the only part here. The other part of Jesus' point is backed up by John's words. John calls Jesus in his answer to his disciples the Christ. He's the promised one. His coming is the fulfillment of multiple promises and centuries of waiting. Why is John full of joy over the presence of the bridegroom? Because the faithfulness of God is on display in the coming of Jesus. And the plan of God is taking a major step forward with his arrival. That's time for celebration It is time for joy. The Messiah is on the scene. He has come just as God promised. Now the imagery of marriage is used all over Scripture to refer to the relationship of God to His people. In Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, We see this example, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It's also common to use this type of imagery in the New Testament to refer to the relationship between Jesus and those who believed in him. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 11, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So Jesus' point in using this imagery is clear. He's saying, look, I know that your practices are important to you, and I know that it's hard for you to accept But I'm not bound by your practices. Maybe you should look past your expectations so that you can truly see who I am. I am the promised one. I'm the bridegroom and the husband of all the analogies of the law and the prophets. If you can just see who I am, then you can join in the celebration of God's faithfulness at my coming. Your expectations may cause you to misunderstand who Jesus is. But the second statement I want you to consider this morning is this. Your expectations may cause you to misunderstand why Jesus came. 
Your expectations may cause you to misunderstand why Jesus came. Look back at verse 15. And look at the very last sentence. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. There are two things we have to see here. First, this isn't something that would be typical at a wedding celebration. It's probably pretty difficult to find someone who experienced a bridegroom uh, getting yanked out of a wedding celebration uh, before it ended. I mean, he's not talking about a bride or a bridegroom running away before the wedding. He's not talking about, you know, it rained too hard to have the wedding, and so everybody went back home. That's not what he's talking about. But you might say, well, isn't he talking about after the celebration, after the marriage is completed? And I don't don't think so. And that's the second thing I want you to see here. That phrase is taken away from them. The them in this analogy that Jesus is giving is his disciples. So he's talking about something being taken away from them. And the words taken away are very strong in the original language. The implication is of forcible removal. Like of someone coming in and yanking the bridegroom out. Jesus is not casually referring to the end of a wedding celebration. He's saying, my disciples will fast again. They will fast when I... The promised bridegroom am taken away. Now this should strike the disciples of John. Because as we've already seen earlier in Matthew, John has been arrested by Herod for his preaching. He's already imprisoned. He was taken away and Jesus says, I expect. To be taken away. And then my disciples will fast. Now this phrase is a foreshadowing of his crucifixion. This is why he came. He didn't come to celebrate. He didn't come to conquer. He didn't come to rule. He came to die. And this, too, was prophesied long ago. Listen to these words from Isaiah 53, 8. Isaiah 53 is probably the clearest prophecy regarding the purpose of the coming of the promised Messiah. And here is part of a question. We read these words. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. The question here is, is, isn't this the one who was taken away and judged, cut off from his people because of their transgressions? With his words, Jesus is foreshadowing his own death on the cross for sin. He will be taken away and stricken For sin, not his own sin, but for other sin. For his disciples' sins, for our sin. This is what John the Baptist meant with these words that we find in John chapter 1. And he said, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Don't let your expectations cause you to misunderstand why I came, Jesus is saying. There will be time for mourning. There will be time for fasting. 
The analogy with the wedding is over. I came to be taken away and murdered. And Jesus would share these same ideas with his disciples many times. Even up, even up to the last moment. His last moments for them before his death. Luke records him, him saying these words to his disciples as they celebrated the Passover together at a meal that we call the Last Supper. Luke 22, Luke writes, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It may have been difficult for them to completely understand all that Jesus was saying with these words. I mean, it is a little bit of a cryptic answer to a pretty straightforward question. But if you drill down onto the, into the details, you can see that now is not a time to mourn, but there will be a time when I'm gone, and that is when my disciples should fast. So even though it was hard to understand in the moment, I'm sure that Matthew and the other disciples understood it perfectly after Jesus' death. Jesus' death was the main reason for his coming. The main reason. And it ushered in a new promise. Did you hear it in his words in Luke? A new promise, a new Covenant, And that makes his next words in Matthew very clear. Look at Matthew 9, 16, and 17. For no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst. And the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. I'm sure you can picture what he's saying here, even if you've never been a seamstress or never had to sew up uh, a hole in your clothing, which, do we do we even do that anymore? (laughs) No. Our clothes are so cheaply made, and we just used to throw them away and go in and get another one, right? But in Jesus' day, right, they, they, w- they, would, they would get a new robe, and over time, they would wash it. It would get wet, and the, going through the, you know, the, their daily activities, and, and it would dry out, and it would shrink. And, you know, if you got a hole in that thing, and you went and you, like, found a new piece of, of cloth, and you're like, man, I love my robe. I don't want to lose my robe. And you cut out a little patch, and you, you had that stitched in there right over the hole, and you went about your day and, and weeks and months, and you washed it, and it got wet, and eventually that patch started to shrink. Your robe wasn't shrinking because it had already shrunk, but the patch starts to shrink. And Jesus says, and then it starts tearing at where it's connected to the old fabric, and it rips an even bigger hole. You've got an even bigger problem. Same is true with the wineskins, right? The the new wine ferments in an old wineskin. That thing is going to explode because of the gases that it's putting off in the fermentation process. He said, you you don't mix the new and the old in certain ways. It's destructive. It's not beneficial. And you can see he's, he's playing new against old here. If you look at how many times those words are repeated, new and old, new and old, new and old. He didn't come to fulfill people's expectations. In Jesus' own words, he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Oh, Jesus came to meet every single one of God's expectations. And he never let him down. You know God's words, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He wasn't an add-on to the old covenant. He was its completion. He was what the old covenant looked forward to. 
He didn't come to give credence to traditions and rituals that people practiced in addition to the Old Covenant. He didn't come to patch up the Old Covenant. Maybe it just has a few weak spots. First of all, if God makes a covenant, there are no weak spots in the covenant, right? He didn't come to just be, you know, sewn onto that covenant. He didn't come to do that. He came to usher in a new covenant. This is why Jesus came. Listen to the words of the new covenant found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah writing for the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. why so much of Jesus teaching points to the need for heart change this isn't something that the old covenant can do it can't change the heart ritualistic practice can't change the heart there are certain things that are good even important as you said earlier Jesus fasted But fasting cannot change the heart. That's only something God can do. And their hearts needed to be made new. And Jesus' death makes all this possible. God can't just push aside the old covenant. I'm going to forgive your iniquity. I'm going to forgive your sin and I'm just going to install a new covenant because you blew the old one. No. The wages of sin is death. Death. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came to bring a new way of life. He came to make it possible for people to be made new. It's why Paul could write these words to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The expectations of the people were for Jesus to bolster and strengthen the old covenant. And instead, Jesus came to be taken away and to bring in the new. So where are you this morning? What what expectations do you have about Jesus? Do you try and conform Jesus to your expectations? Because Jesus will not conform to your expectations. It's pretty clear. Jesus was not afraid of showing who he truly was, the God-man. And he was certainly not about to start pleasing people with his words and actions. Jesus will not conform to your expectations for him. 
your expectations may cause you to misunderstand who Jesus is. And your expectations may cause you to misunderstand why Jesus came. You know, if you've never given your life to Jesus, then I want to urge you today to give your life to him. Stop trying to make Jesus who you want him to be. Accept who he is and why he came. That is the good news. Who you want him to be is bad news. It doesn't involve heart change. It doesn't involve forgiveness. It doesn't involve reconciliation with God. And in it, there is no hope. Accept who he is and why he came. He is the son of God who died for your sin so that you might escape the judgment of God and experience eternal life. Is who you want Jesus to be really better than that? Jesus will not conform to you, but will you surrender to him today? Christian, are you experiencing the new life that Jesus came to bring? I hope you can remember the words from John 10. This is the third time I've spoken them today. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Today, remember who Jesus is and why he came. And use that in your own battle with sin and find victory. Jesus came so that you, could no lo- you would no longer be enslaved to sin. Jesus came to reconcile you to a holy God. Jesus came so that when you confess your sin before a holy God, you can be restored in fellowship to God. And Jesus came so that the Spirit of God could dwell inside of you And you could find repentance and life change. Jesus came so that you could become new. Listen to Paul's words to the church at Rome in Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in newness. Who is Jesus? Let's pray together. Father, we love Jesus. I love Jesus, the fact that he pulled no punches, that he just said it like it was, that he was a real, that he was a real, real person, a real man. Father, I love so much more what Jesus came to do and who he was and the doing of it. We are all amazed that as the Son of God, he came to die for us. Father, I pray that you would drive that truth home. For those who know him, Lord, I pray that it would become a source of great joy and a commitment to live in a way that honors Jesus and follows him. But God, this morning, I want to pray for those who don't know Jesus. Father, I remember 30 years ago sitting in a different place, but with this same, several of these same people, and you opening my own eyes to who Jesus was. 
life and why he came. And I pray you do that this morning for someone here who doesn't know him. Father, I pray that they'd see Jesus in all his glory, in all his humility, in all his love and all his mercy. And they would turn away from their sin and your wrath and turn towards Jesus. And Father, I pray that for them in Jesus' great name. Let's stand and sing together. service is hard than to end with this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Go in grace and be blessed this week. God bless you.